wheelhouse DNA. Take the hit. Don't hide it. You know, just take it all straight on. And it's like, um, it's like you're being poked with a stick and it's right here. And it, it never stops. You get used to it, but it's always there. A piece of you is gone. And that's it. it as soon as I accepted a lot of that, that I could start to just get through the day. From Wheelhouse DNA and Acast, this is Comfort Food, a show about life, loss, grief, celebration, and the meals that support us through it all. I'm your host, Kelly Rizzo. My guest today was one of the first people I thought of when creating this show. I can't say enough about him. He was a steadfast presence right by my side in the early days of losing Bob. He's a beloved actor, musician, now New York Times bestselling author. His book, If You Would Have Told Me, just came out, and we get into it. So if you're looking for more details about his incredible story, please buy it now. Anyway, he's one of my favorite people on this entire planet. So please join me in welcoming my dear friend and brother, John Stamos. Well, John, welcome to Comfort Food. Kelly, thank you. The enduring popularity of the show, I'm talking about Full House now, is a testament to the power of universal human experiences. It's a warm comfort food of decency in a cold world of discord and division. Welcome to Kelly's Podcast. (laughs) What's it called? That was Comfort perfect. Food? Oh, good. That was amazing. It took me, folks out there listening, it took me 25 minutes to find that little one sentence there. But was well, it you know, it was it? worth it. And I'm grateful not only for that sentence from your book, but to have you here, it means so much because even though I want this, of course, to be more about you, I want you to know and the world to know what an incredible source of comfort you've been to me throughout this last almost two years now, which is just crazy that it's been two years, almost since we lost Bob. And from day one, you were one of the first people at my house. I think you were the second person at my house to be very, very specific. And ever since then, just being in your presence gives me the most immense source of comfort because I know you were one of, if not the closest person to him. And so I've said from day one that I just like to be around Bob people. I'm sure you felt that too. Yes. That it gives you comfort to be around Bob people. And there's no bigger Bob person (laughs) than than you. Well, it's my honor to be a Bob person and to be that for you because uh, I don't know how you, it's almost two years. I don't know how you've gotten through the two years. I barely have. I've cried on every talk show talking about him and I'm not going to cry today. No, that's what my, you think. That's what you I think. brought in uh, some props because I'm like, yeah. you know, like this is my picture, my special picture of Bob. It's in this uh, angel wing thing and yeah. this frame. I love that picture. And then you, you blew me away because you gave me some of a couple of Bob's things. Right. His guitar, which I cherish. I don't play it much because all you can do is dirty songs on there. Yeah. It only plays. Yeah. Do you guys cuss dirty on Dirty Bob thing? songs. You can say whatever you, you want. You can kiss my eyes. You can lick my balls. You, can, you know, yeah. that's those songs. <laughs> um, but I stare at it all the time. You got me this beautiful uh, wooden carved thing of Jiminy Cricket. And you said that was Bob's favorite Disney character. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Well, for anyone who doesn't know, and I guess if you know John Stamos at all, you know that he is a Disney file. And uh, you are one of the biggest Disney World, Disneyland, Disney fans. Do you ever. remember when we all went? Yeah, was, that was one that of that was a special night. That was a very special time. We went for Caitlin's birthday. It was just eight of us, and, and then the six of us spent the night, and we were mm-hmm. all just we all. And Caitlin brought onesies for everybody. Yeah. Bob was so pissed; his onesie was a little tight on him. It was a little tight. It didn't zip all the way, right? And he was so mad. And every picture of him is just <laughs> pouting. Yeah, he's just pouting, and we were all happy and jumping around, and he was just mm, just he, a mean look on his face the whole time. But he was cute, like cute. So you love Disney, of course, and you have so much incredible Disney memorabilia, but Bob loved Jiminy Cricket so much. And it's so interesting. You didn't know that, but when we, when he passed, it was so important to us, you know, to me and Bob's girls to give his dearest friends, you know, a lot of his stuff because, you know, whether it was clothes, I know we gave you some clothes. You know the story, remember I went to Jody's wedding and Caitlin was rushing me. I couldn't figure out what to wear. (gasps) Right after the and I just put some outfit on and I went there and, and I was, I got, I was walking around. I was like, this shirt feels a little big on me. And, I, yeah. and it, and when I looked at the tag, it turned out to be that it was, I happened to just pick Bob's shirt to wear to Jody's wedding. He couldn't be there. And so he wasn't in, in shirtness. 
Can I say I just love you and and I'm I'm you. so proud of you for for the way you've handled everything. And I knew I talk about it. I knew Bob. I knew you were the one for Bob because when you said uh, we were at something and he was talking and talking and talking and you said Bob, it's, it's not all all about you. It's not all about Bob tonight. I go, oh my god, she gets it. But then you split. You Wait, said, hand me your book because I I have the, I okay, have that sentence that. that I want to read it. Okay. And this is what touched me so much because it meant that you truly did. got Bob, but got me and got our relationship. And the fact that from this one little moment, you were able to extrapolate that we had this special connection was so important. But you said, I knew from the start that she really loved Bob for Bob, the way we all did. She'd listen to him rattle on about himself for a bit longer than I usually would. The first time she said to him, this isn't all about you, Bob. I knew she was the one. <laughs> He'd pout, she'd kiss him, and in a sweet tone, she'd say, you know I love you, honey. We should talk about how he met you, too, because I was there. I was helping him get through that thing, too. Do you remember we were, he was texting you, and we FaceTimed you and stuff, and I was sort of his Cyrano, he, as he called it, and I was telling him what to do, what to say. Yeah, to, I was uh, living in Chicago, and we had just started talking, and I remember it was a little surreal because he went to some event with you, some yeah, we, premiere. It was Gary Mar It was Valentine's Day. And he, he FaceTimed me from the back of, you know, we were the at car. the, uh, no, oh, yes, the car. But then we were at the Chateau, I think, too, Paul, you. Yeah. And I remember I was, I was like, is this really you have? Like, it was so yeah. surreal at the time. I'm like, Bob and John FaceTiming me? Like, this was so strange. But, you know, it was from day one, he just really incorporated me into everything. And from day one, even before we, you know, way before I moved out to LA, he, you know, there was never a moment that he didn't make me feel like, you're the one. I'm making yeah. this happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is it. And he loved you so much. Now. He was he was so lucky to 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 have met you. And when you came around, I was like, okay. Because I felt because I was with Caitlin already, and I, and we'd always talked about it, Bob and I, like finding the one and being with someone that we love for life. And you know, we certainly did. and I talk about it in, in the book about um about our last dinner together. The fact that um we sat there and we go like. How did two schnooks like us get so lucky to be with these two smart, beautiful, inside and out women? And we were just sitting there going, how, how fucking lucky are we? It's everything that we, we both of us wanted. We, we finally got to a place. I did anyway. I mean, him maybe not as much, but career was second. Like love and family was first. It, but he, you know, he had three daughters. And he I, had I done was, the family yeah. thing for years. And yeah. you, what what was so interesting to me, learning a little bit about your journey with Bob and, you know, cause I'd always heard his side of the story of things, um, your relationship with him, but then to hear your side of the story in your book, um, in terms of, you know, he would always say that I, he was so jealous of you, you know, John, you, you know, he was single and he was getting all the gals and I had to, you know, I was married and I had kids about our time way back in the yeah, day, like right. early full house days. Yeah. And he was jealous of you. And, you know, John would spend hours in front of the mirror doing his hair. And, you know, but, you know, he was all all the gals loved him and nobody paid attention to me, you know, because he always felt like that nerdy kid in high school type of thing. But then reading your book, that's how you had felt in him. high school, too. Uh -huh. But then you were jealous of Bob because... He had the family that you yes, wanted, yeah. like you wanted to be a dad, you wanted to be married, yes. and you were jealous of that. Yes. And so it's interesting that that dynamic really went both ways. We were too proud to tell each other. In the book, I start with the terrible day that I got this DUI, and I was on my way to meet Bob at the Palm. We weren't dating yet, but he right. had told me the story that, that was terrible. Um, you know, from his perspective, he was waiting at the Palm and waiting at the Palm, and he yeah. couldn't get a hold of you. And yeah. And then he said, his version is that he's like, I saved his life because I just randomly called a hospital and called uh -huh. a doctor friend of your guys and he knew your alias and he said, did right. anyone come to the hospital under this alias? Because they were looking all at all the hospitals and the Johnson was there, Johnson was there, and they were like, oh, right. wait a minute. And then Bob knew to ask the right person and knew uh -huh. your alias and they found you in two seconds and then Bob went right to the hospital and was at your bedside when you yeah. woke up. I'm out and then I'm on the table and I see this, I woke up oh, my eyes and I see this white light and then I see this shadow of a of a of a man, and I, saw, I thought it was Jesus, but it was Bob, who was my Jesus at the time. Maybe, look, he was there for for me. He was there. He was always there. Like you'd always count on him. I always said that if I was hanging off a cliff, like and there was just one branch, and I had one phone call, it would, it would be to Bob. 
Yeah. No, he wouldn't answer in the first ring. And I call again. Then when I talked to him, he'd say, what do you want? I'm, I'm busy. I can't talk and hang up. He would call us. He would call me and Dave and, and go, uh, I'm too busy. I can't talk to you. He's like, like you, you called, called me. Us. Ooh, the comfort food's coming in. You better be ready. My comfort food is chicken pot pie. Comfort food, when you say it, it comes flying in. How is it, Kelly? Did you make this, Kelly? I did not make it because this is a very complicated recipe. And here's the thing. This involves baking and I don't bake. Seems like it could be hot. What I was going to say was it took me a while to come to terms with Full House, as, as I've said everywhere. It took me a while to come to terms with Bob. The two hardest were the Full House chapters because I know how important it is to everybody. I just didn't know how to tell eight years and, and such a big chunk of life and my life and everyone else's life. So I started with Bob and I not get, getting along. So and do you mean logistically it was hard or it was hard emotionally? No, it was just hard because I knew how important it was to people. Okay. I knew how important the show was. And it wasn't, Jeff Franklin was over a couple of weeks ago and he's writing a book too. And, and he was asking me, when did you come to terms with Full House, basically? And I said, when I wrote the book and not, Kind of, kind of said I did over the years, but I, I really didn't understand why what people saw in it or why people liked it for, and it's been still on for so long. And writing it down and just really thinking about how what it means to people and what it meant to people and what we were not the normal family that we weren't the mom and dad and two point five kids. We were right. we were the we were the new normal. We were, and so every year that divorce is on the rise and all these families out there could watch the show and go, well, I'm a family too, just because it's not a mom and a dad a thing. So that really resonated with me. Also, as well, and, the, a, and people who lost a parent. People who lost a parent or three gay dads in San Francisco raising. We didn't even bat an eye at that. It was like, okay, it's three dads, three guys. Look, I got the critics got in my ear and I let them. And, and I was, you know, during that time, I was like, I should be on a more sophisticated show. I should be on the, and the truth is that it, they didn't get it. It wasn't, if you didn't get it, we, it wasn't for you. No. Um, and that's fine. You know, but, and, and they, they weren't pulling, they weren't smarter than me. I know it was silly at times and fatsal and just, you know, it was overdone and the music and the hugging and, you know, drove me crazy too. But, <laughs> but what happened was that it's in lieu of sophistication, sweetness came out and, and the brain slides over to the side and it made room for the, a real, um, Decency, a home cooked meal, right? And the incredible chemistry you can't that you guys it. had together. You, you could never recreate that and lasts to this day because you all, I mean, like Bob used to say to me all the time, he would have, he would show me, even from day one, he would show me your group texts. <laughs> He'd be like, look, Full House is real. Because it would be uh, all of you guys on a group chat, like just talking all the time, right, like right. a real family. He kept us all together, by the way, over the years. And, that, and we just became closer and closer. When I finally gave into the fact that Bob was a genius and, and we started to be there for each other, there was a moment when his sister got scleroderma and, and um, Dave's sister had a very bad cancer. And at the same time, they found a brain tumor in my sister's uh, head. And we then became not three guys on a show, but three brothers that were grieving their sisters. And, you know, as we know, Bob's sister, uh, gay, right? She yeah. passed away before she got to see how much work he's done for scleroderma. It's so sad. And then Dave's sister died. And, and thank God my sister was misdiagnosed and she had MS and she's still around. But then, then that became a little weird because, because I was, their sisters were gone and mine was still, but that's how really did what you, what was the, dynamic then because i mean granted yes your sister thankfully it was still here mm -hmm. but still it was very very scary for a very while scary, of course yeah. but they lost their sisters yeah. how did you guys help each other through that like what was that grieving process like right we i think we just listened you know we were just there uh, we talked for hours and hours. We used to go over Dave's house. Sometimes I remember we sit in front uh, around the fire. And it, the the last time I remember going to Dave's in the fire was we just gone to see Bob's uh, mom in the hospital, all three of us. And I'm sure he's talking. He told you about that story, right? Didn't he do jokes about that we went in there and Dave was had gas and his mom was so cute. And it, she would put on lipstick yeah. to look pretty because she knew you were coming over. Yeah, and she was um, perfume and everything. And then so what Dave was gassing it up the room she took her perfume out and she was squirting at dave's butt and it was she had she was she had this this light about her and it was weird because there was a light like coming in and i took pictures and video of that 
And I have video of Bob. Like, there's mom running around. Doing, and then I think she died the next day or day, day after that. But um, we were all sitting around. Um, and at that point, we were worried about our moms dying. And, uh, and Dave's mom was kind of sick. And she went to my mom. It was... Uh, so we've so just, you all almost... Well, lost and almost lost your sisters at the same time. Uh, and then you all lost your moms yeah. pretty much at the same time. Yeah. We were just right? there because we were so close. We were there for when life happened. Divorce. Other people, you know, die. My dad died and Bob, um, I asked Bob to host the, the, you know, the reception after. And so talking about grieving, getting over stuff. I mean, Bob's was humor, obviously. And sometimes it was, you know, that term too soon was, was invented for Bob, I think, because... <laughs> It would be the next day and he was, you know, he would be talking about eating his sister's guts or something. I don't oh, know. You know, I would say stuff. He would uh, say things that were so graphic and so inappropriate, but somehow it's like he was the guy that was able to get away with this stuff, you know? It was his way. And, and sometimes it wasn't the people around him our way. Right. But it was like, Bob, come on, man. I just, you know. But, you know, I learned from him and not even intentionally but i remember the day after bob passed away my family had flown in i was in my bed because i literally couldn't yeah. move and this might have been two days afterward do you remember i was like really sick yeah we were like 103 food, fever you know. all week it was really really bad and um my mom and sisters and my best friend aggie were in my bedroom with me and my mom was walking by and she was crying, like walking by the bed. And she was just crying. I go, mom, what's wrong? And she's like, oh, I go, what did Bob die? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, right. and like, it just came out of me. Right, right. And it was so like, it was almost like Bob made the joke through me, right, you know? Right, right, right. And I remember my sister looked at me and she goes, Kelly. Yeah. And I was like, hey, A, I'm allowed to say whatever I want right now. <laughs> like that was something that Bob would have joked about. For like, sure. He would have said that. And he would have said it an hour after one right. of us died. Not, he wouldn't have waited a date or, or two. But what's <laughs> interesting is that one of the things, it sounds like you made such huge progress in your grief journey um, because you were saying in your book, like when you lost your mom, you know, the five steps that you went through were five stages of grief. Yeah. Well, that, you yeah. know, it was, you know, it was, everything was negative. Yeah. It was more alcohol, drugs, drugs and, sex, right. drugs, all the bad stuff. And then when it was Bob yes. years later, it was a very mature, evolved progression through Sobriety, those. Sobriety, prayer, family, uh, 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 therapy, 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 and, uh, and uh, meditation and such. I did the same thing because when I read that, that you used prayer, I remember just being like, dear God, please just get me through this. Just yeah. help me to get through this. And that, that was my prayer that I prayed like from day one. That's a good one. With Bob, because Here, well, there's really uh, nothing else you can ask for, right? Like you can't ask for something specific. It's like, just help, just let me get through this. <laughs> that's a lesson. <laughs> that's but you know, that, Maybe that maybe that's, that's the lesson. That's you know? what I tell people. I go, um, take the hit, don't hide it. You know, just right. take it all straight on. And it's like um it's like you're being poked with a stick in, right here. And it it never stops. You get used to it, but it's right. always there. A piece yeah. of you is gone. And that's it. it. As soon as I accepted a lot of that, then I could start to just get through the day. That's a good way to look at it. It's always, right, you just get used to it. It's like yeah, the pain, it's like, so it's still annoying. It's still there. It's still there. You still feel it, but it's, you just get used you to it. Forget about it. And that's sad too. Like you were talking about my dad, like it's been about 20, I think it's 20 years or so. And I said, you got to watch Coco. Did you watch Coco when I told you, when I asked you to, when Bob passed away? I think so, yeah. In I don't Coco, the timing, it, was, but yeah. It's, it was, it's beautiful because in their, in their um, culture. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. You don't just die. You die once and then. You have to keep their name alive. You have to put pictures up, up of them. We have an friend of, of my dad, and my mom, and Bob now is on there and her dog. And all but you have to tell stories about them to keep them alive eternally up there. Uh, otherwise, they'll wither away. And right. Go. So that's what we're doing with Bob. It means so much to me and to his girls and just to everybody that you keep him front and center in all of yeah. these conversations. And every time you talk about anything, that you are still making him such a big part of 
all of this. And it's just oh, it's out of love. So special. It just comes out, like you said. But also he'll rattle the skies if I don't. <laughs> he'll get pissed. If I don't mention his name at least twenty times a day, it's there's oh there's an earth you feel that earthquake? No, it's Bob. And what was that? You said something in your book somewhere you're like, if you if you listen closely or if you're quiet enough, you can hear Bob complaining somewhere. <laughs> right? Yeah, I think that might have been Dave's joke. I don't know, but that's a, yeah. If yeah. You're quiet. Yeah, there's so much to unpack here, but that, you know, I, uh, I remember, so I got a call from my press agent. It was Sunday. And it, was, and it was sort of rare for him. I said, what's up? He said, have you talked to Bob today? No. Why? Uh, is he okay? What do you mean he's okay? I, I don't, yeah, he's okay. I don't, have you talked to him? No. Matt, spit it out. He, he, you know, he's a great publicist, not a great actor. What, what do you, what, what do you got going on? Now, keep in mind, a week before, a week before Matt calls on the same week, a weekend on a Sunday, gets a hold of Caitlin because I was asleep and says, Caitlin, is, is John okay? He's like, yeah, he, where is he? Upstairs sleeping. You don't want to wake him up. No, no, no. Oh, phew. I just got a call from TMZ saying that he, sources say that he went down in a private plane near San Diego. God. So that was a week before. Calls me again. Says, well, yeah, this is probably bullshit because, you know, what happened last week, but we heard that Bob, you know, died. I said, that's, come on, really? They got to get better sources, this TMZ. Right. And uh, he said, okay, well, good. Did, have you tried to get a hold of him? I said, all right. So I called him. I, he was, uh, he was on the, you know, he was in Florida. And then I said, well, I'll text him because he always answers. Even if he's on a plane, he'll answer and text nothing. Uh, then I called Mike Young, I think. Then, I, then, then Candace texted me. And, and I called you, left a message or two. I think he called her. And t- Candace texted me and said, um, I got this weird DM uh, from this girl in Florida. And she said, um, that Bob died and she's, her sister's a cop and she's on the scene. And then Candace wrote back, you better not, this is not, this is not funny. This is not a joke. And she said, no, I know it's not a joke. I'm sorry to have to- tell, told you I'm a big fan, blah, blah, blah. But I can send you a, a copy of the police report. I immediately called Candace. I said, well, wait, 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 what, what? And she kind of talked about it. Then you started beeping in. As soon as I answered and I was in the parking lot and my Billy was asleep in the back of the car because I was driving around to take a nap. And as soon as I heard your voice, I, I clicked over to you. You were screaming. I went, oh, fuck. And I dropped to my knees on the, on the asphalt at hard. And I, I just, you know, you told me what happened. And I just was screaming. It, it, it was, you know, the worst moment ever. I remember um, I'd only talked to a couple people. And it was just an absolute frenzy. It was a frenzy. And I remember Candace had called me, but I... Clicked her. I don't remember you calling and me not answering your call, but I remember Candace. I clicked her to voicemail because at this point, the first people I talked to, um, I called Sherry, huh. Bob's ex wife, and I told her. And I remember the only words I could say, I, 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 I said, he passed away. Uh, you know, I couldn't say like he died. I still can't say he yeah, died. Yeah, like yeah. it's really weird. You just said it, but, but yeah. I, rem- <laughs> I remember, I remember saying to Sherry, I was like, passed away and I couldn't tell the girls even though I'd been oh. talking to the girls all day because about. we were we were oh, you worried about them. them right, right. Oh, and so we were anything. we knew that the paramedics were there oh, we did. knew that you know we were in touch oh, with gosh. the hotel they were giving me updates I started calling him and I started calling the hotel it was around like maybe 11 30 12 because he was supposed to fly home that day right. and I knew his flight was at like 3 p.m but mm-hmm. I tracked his phone and he was still at the hotel and it didn't make sense right and so when I was calling, um, I finally called the hotel and they were doing a wellness check, which obviously sounds so upsetting. I'm like this, but Bob had always told me, he goes, you worry too much. Uh. So you have to stop worrying about it. Cause it was always my biggest fear that somebody in my family yeah. would be in an accident or something like this would happen. But Bob always convinced me that my worry was just going to, give me cancer or something. And I had to stop. And so this was the first time that even though every cell in my body was like, something's not right. I'm like, don't freak out just yet, Kelly. Of course he's fine. It's fine. Bob, he's not going to ever die. It's fine. He told me not to worry. So I'm going to honor him. And he said not to worry. So everything's fine. But then it just started getting worse and worse. And of course the hotel's like, we're doing a wellness check. And then they said, the paramedics are here. And then they said, law enforcement is here. Oh God. And then they said the paramedics left, but law enforcement is still here. And at that point, 
I knew it was really, really bad. Because at least when it was the paramedics are here, I was like, maybe he had a heart attack. Maybe something happened and they can rush him to the hospital and he'll be okay. And then I finally, finally got the, um, we got uh, somebody from the hotel, a security guard from the hotel on the phone because nobody would give me any answers. And I was like, what is going on? And then finally a security guard got on the phone and I'll never forget. And I mean, for as long as I live, I was standing in my kitchen and he gets on the phone and he's like, is this Mrs. Saget? And I was like, yes. And he goes, we're so sorry. He's like, unfortunately he passed away. And I just like dropped to my knees and just completely lost it. I was like an animal, like writhing on the ground, just like screaming. Like I could not believe it was like, I was like, I felt, it was like an out of body. I mean, you know, you felt it too. Like it was not, I was like, am I in a alternate reality right now? Like this can't be true. And then I called Sherry first and told her and she started screaming. And then I thought it was more, most appropriate for her to tell the girls. And then, um, I think you were the next person. I'll come over and give you a hug. Because oh. I'm, I love you. John. I love you. I think, um, I think and you tell me, but I think talking about all this is part of the healing. Right? I know, but, I don't know. You, but you were, but like anytime I talk about it, it brings me right back to that. And I feel exactly yeah. what I felt that day. Yeah. And you were the next person because people were, but how, this is to say how crazy this is. And you will appreciate this because I've been talking about this a lot lately, this concept of where the media can come in. Yeah. I found out about it. Candace had already known. Before and you. Candace had probably called you because when I found out, you were calling me within five minutes. So meaning all of these people already knew. And when I found out, it had hit TMZ like 15 minutes later. So meaning the media knew before I even knew, which is so crazy to me. And then <sighs> Candace was the first person to show up at my house like within 30 minutes. And I then called, you were there 30 minutes later. I called Dave and I said, Dave, Bob Saget died. I don't know why I had to use his whole name. Like, yeah. you know, like, like I was like, it could have been Bob Hope or something. No, um, I get, this is good to get it out, I guess. Right. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't know. when we went to your house, excuse me, we went to your house and every, there were some people there and the photographers well, the were there too. the first day it was it's like, all a blur, but I it, went, it is a blur, but I went to there and we hugged and then, uh, fell to the ground, I think too. And, and then, I remember the second day, Caitlin showed up at my house at like seven in the morning and made me breakfast because yeah. I hadn't slept or eaten or anything. And, and, and then she Lori was an and I angel. went and picked up a bunch of food and all that kind of stuff too, I think. Um, yeah. And the funny story was that we were all sitting around crying and, and we certainly, this would, that would have been the moment that Bob would have come in and taken care of everything. Okay, yeah. Boom, I've got the cemetery. I get the, but we, everybody was, we didn't know what to do, right? We were all looking. It's like, where's, when's Bob going to come save us and tell us? He was the, he was the great... I called him like a celebrity uh, concierge, right? He would slash get, grief counselor. He yeah, was the yes, guy. Right, yeah, he yeah. was the guy. We were all stuck knocking into each other like idiots because we didn't know we didn't have Bob, and everybody was there. And all of a sudden, we heard this muffled song. It was a John Mayer song. I can't. Remember. Do you remember what song it was? I remember um, you said in your book, uh, yeah. Heartbreak Warfare. Yeah. And it was just a, a thing. And then all of a sudden, we heard it and didn't really pay attention. And then Candace like, leaps across the table and grabs her purse. And her, Candace and Lori run to your kitchen. I'm like, what the hell? It was a John Mayer song. But John Mayer was there, was sitting right next to it. And so, <laughs> Candace so they were so, so embarrassed. embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't think he knew it. I, had, I think I told him later that what had happened. But and then I went into the backyard and... It was this warm, weird, balmy night. I was like, Bob, come on, man. Give me a sign. Are you okay? And nothing. And, and I want to be haunted by you, Bob. Come on, man. So if you're up there, I know you're not down there. You've done a lot of good in this world. Give me a sign. Nothing. Silence. And, and I was like, oh, man. And then all of a sudden, and I have a video of it, this little hummingbird comes down. And it had a red scarf around the neck. And so I thought, that's my mom. My mom. because. My mom had red hair and red, and she just kind of said, you know, Bob's okay. Everything's okay. And flew off. And that was it. And I felt, oh, and then I thought if he wasn't, if he wasn't settled, if he wasn't okay with where he was at, he'd be rattling the skies and there'd be thunder and lightning and it was calm. So I took it that 
I call, I remember thinking like, he's so alive to die. And my friend Jamie Lee Curtis, I called her during this and she said, that's the way you want to, you, you want to go alive. You don't want to die on a, you know, an old couch, bitter and depressed and, you know, full of anger. That's interesting though, that you said you want to be haunted by him. Yeah. Um, it's, it's true in a sense. It's like you want their presence to be lingering around you. And, you know, I'm in a place now where, you know, I like it, the first several months, it, it, there's not one minute that goes by where it's not on your mind and you're not haunted by it. It, but not and, you want him. Right. And now I'm at a place where, you know, I'll have minutes or, you know, an hour that goes by where it's, it's not in my mind. And then when it is, when I see a happy photo or a video or something, it's happy memories. And now I'm able to like appreciate these things and not get that constant pit in my stomach. Yeah. I can get the pit in my stomach when I go back to the place, yeah. you know, oh, but when yeah. I'm just thinking about, you know, like when I heard his voice just now, like yeah. it made me happy. Yes, yes, yes. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, Didn't you think that that time at our house for that week after when people were coming over every day, mm -hmm. it's weird. I know, you know, we just even mentioned John Mayer and I know a lot of people have said this, that they almost missed that time that we had for that week after he passed when we were all together, even though it was the saddest time ever and it was so upsetting and it was so sad but there was this interesting camaraderie that took place where we were all there for each other and helping each other and, uh, you know, sharing Bob's stories and sharing all the love that that like circle of people was almost something that we ended up missing when it, we didn't have that anymore. Yeah, it was Bob's, he got us together one last time. I was thinking about the first death that I've, I've experienced around me. And it was my grandmother, I think. And um, I was, uh, well, when writing the book, I was talking about a scene that I did in General Hospital where I was, where my, mo where my mom in General Hospital died. And I was trying to picture like my mom dying now. Nah, she's, she's in Orange County right now teaching CCD or something. That didn't work. But I remember hearing, I was downstairs. We lived, you know, and, and my mom was upstairs and my uncle came over and my mom, I could just remember hearing through the walls, my mom screaming, wow, same thing as what I did with Bob. Screaming, no, no. And that's when she found out her, her mother had passed away. Then I spent every day worried about my parents dying. Same, same with you, with me, same with Bob. Every day. And, and I'll never forget it. I was out, to, I was out at the, chat, I was at one of these, with the Hotel Whiskey or something with a bunch of people and, and Helen Hunt was there and, and uh, I said, um, uh, we, we had a conversation about, about it. I, I, she said, do you ever go to therapy? I said, no. I said, I think if I lost my mom or dad or... I said, the only thing I'm really, you know, fucked over that it's a constant is that I worry about losing my parents. And, um, but I, but I, I self-diagnosed myself and said, like, but if, I'm, if I go to a shrink, they're just going to say, look, they're here now. Enjoy them. Like, so that's what I was doing at the time. And then my dad, my dad died the next day. Or he got, he had a heart attack in the uh, Las Vegas... Uh, uh, airport and they revived him at like halfway and then he was in a coma for six months at our house it was terrible just terrible yeah. and you go like was it was it better to was it better to have that time with him we had this hopes for a few months that he would come out of it and he didn't and my dad died and bob was there for me that's that's when it really we were really that's when it started right and he got me through with humor and just listening and just being with me and, and, and recalling you know stories but I remember it just being like the worst, the worst, the, the worst. And he here's one thing you do, you do get, you did, you do get over it in a sense. You don't get over it, over it. It's not like, oh, I'm totally fine. I don't you know. It's, like, it, it's always there. A piece of you is gone. And, that, and like I said, you have to accept that. Um, there's no, there's no turning back. You said something really interesting. I was, after a, a couple of months, I was like, Kelly, I've been thinking about this. Now he fell, my head buried and, my, and she goes, yeah none of that's going to bring him back, John. I said, you're right. That and that was the really last time. Matter, didn't you matter. Know? Yeah, it didn't matter. But it, 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 it does, it, you will get through a day and then you get through two days and then you get through, th you'll think of them all the time, like you said, and then it comes. And I'm at the point, like with my dad, where I was just saying, I was in Greece uh, recently and I always, every time I went to Greece, my dad was there. He was so alive and every person I saw, every restaurant, every, I could hear his voice. I really felt extremely close to him. Over the summer, I went there and I brought Billy and my, and my wife and everybody. And it was my birthday, and I wasn't feeling him. 
And it was a bummer for me because it was like, I, I, it was starting to dissipate um, because of the time. And I was like, this is crappy that I don't, I don't, it's not coming, it doesn't come up all the time, my dad. I'm not thinking like I used to. And like you said, first it's every minute, then it's every five minutes, then it's every hour. Then right. it, and then so years go by and you don't think of them. And I was really, depressed. and then all of a sudden Billy started talking about my dad. I go, oh, oh. It's, he's talking through, it's it, Billy feels him right now. And, and, and that then got me thinking and telling stories to my son about my dad. Um, so that's part of it. It does, you can, you get through the day, but it, right. Eventually. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you, and then there's the whole thing of you start to feel guilty if you're not well, thinking about you, it every five well, you minutes. We're and, having a, a moment of, of levity at one point. You were having a fun night and you said, I feel so guilty because Bob would have been so bad at me for not agreeing. Right. And that's bullshit. Like, you you know, obviously we can't tell you enough that you don't shouldn't feel guilty. Right. Well, now I realize that, yes, of course, he'd want me to be happy. And I don't want to hear about be, dating. Right. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to. Right. My wife was like, ask her about dating. I'm like, no. I don't want to know. She can date whatever. She's happy about it. I don't want to know anything about it. So as, as Bob's uh, proxy, you don't want to know about no it. No <laughs> way. All right. I all don't right. care. I, okay. If you're happy, great. Well, but, th- th- what's interesting is that Bob was the guy who he would say to me, is almost you said, he would say to me, don't worry. When you lose your parents one day, I'm going to be there for you. I'm the pro. I'm the guy to get you through this. Yeah. I know what to do. So you don't have to worry about it because I will carry you through. Right. And then I lose Bob. And I'm like, well, in a sense, I'm like, well, I got through losing my husband. Clearly now I'm somewhat experienced with grief. So when I do lose my parents, at least, yeah. you know, yeah. I'll, I'll have some practice. But I'm like, but where's get- the guy that's supposed to help me with my parents? You know? Right. I'll, I'll, I'll be around. Thank you, John. Your parents are going to live forever. We're all going to live They're forever. They're doing pretty well. But I'm going to take you up on that. Well, um, you, yeah, I'm always here yeah. for you. We all are. I mean, because of Bob, you've met so, you, 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 you have a whole network of people that love you and care about you. You got ripped off. That's the first thing that we thought. Jeff, Jeff Ross said it best because you only got him for, what, five, six years? Right. And you know what? And, and here's the thing. I totally appreciate and in a sense, to an extent, agree. Yes, of course I did. Jeff said that at his funeral. You said it in your book. You said it to me from day one, like you got ripped off. But it's just been so much, I mean, I agree, yeah. but I've. it's also been much more productive and helpful and like therapeutic for me to think, no, lucky me. Yes. Some people didn't get to know Bob at all. Some people never got to meet him. Right. Some people didn't get to be in his life. Some people didn't get to love him and be loved by him. You're right. And I got all those things for six years. Right. Lucky me. That's a good point. You said something when you, 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 when you finished the book, you called me and you were crying. And Hysterically. You said, and you said... Um, Very hard. <laughs> do you remember what you said? You said, if you don't know Bob... I said that Bob would be so proud and honored by the tribute that you gave to him because you captured him so perfectly that if you don't know Bob and you read your book, you're going to get such a good sense of who he really was. Not Danny Tanner, not, you know, entourage, not the comedian. You get a sense of who he really was and you did such justice to him. Thank you. That meant the most to me because we could only talk about him so much on talk shows and this show and, you know, stuff with, you know, books, whatever, like, you just hope that and this book will be around forever, hopefully. And people, if they ever want to know about Bob, it's in here. I was very nervous. There was I some stuff. I read something from it. Okay. I, there was some stuff in here that I, um, when I was writing, I was like, oh, would I say this if he was alive? He would be mad. There, Bob was a complicated man, as as a, you know, as we all are. He he wasn't black or white or he wasn't one dimensional at all. And he was very, there's a lot of layers and there's a lot of things going on with him. You know, he was very... What kills me was, and I've said this before, that 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 when he died, there was a tsunami of love. Well, it touches on that, but right. yeah, if, pretend I'm going to read this in in John's voice because this this killed me too because this was so special and just meant so much to me. Like you know, as his wife, like just that you pinpointed this, but you said his death brings a well-deserved tsunami of love, an outpouring from all ages, respect from his peers. What a talent. What a kind, good man. What an icon. And these are the accolades he wanted all of his life. The irony is he already had it. 
His ego couldn't accept it because the adoration didn't come in the form of having more power in show business. I'm heartbroken he didn't think he was enough. He was and always will be to me and the rest of the world. And that was just so special, John, because you're right. Like he was, it was so complicated that he, in one sense, like knew how loved he was. But then in another sense, he just, he, he was so insecure with his place in the world and with his place in show business, in show business, I would say. And the fact that these peers, people who he idolized. Who idolized showed, him. Right. Too. Well, he like, found, well, now it's like, Chappelle look how much or, they loved him. Right, right, right. And um, I, what, what I said to Chappelle, I said, you're the goat, man. You made Bob feel so special these last few years. Yeah. I know you did. And he said, he, when I was an up and coming comic, he helped me. He advised me. He was there for me. It was like, okay. wow. We, we didn't do that. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. No, it just, this was something really special that um, I think is so important for, that captures kind of everything is that you said, when you lose someone special, that final time together becomes mythic and magical. Yeah. Every detail is a holy relic. You try to remember that feeling of closeness. Like, what did we eat? Did we stay a little longer for coffee and dessert? I hope so. And that's so interesting because, like, when you lose somebody, you're like, oh, my God, why didn't I right, the last remember time. that a little bit more? Why didn't I put more attention to that? Like, why didn't I? Uh, well, you never know. You know. Tomorrow's never promised that we're, we're, you know, we've now learned. And so when you're with someone, this, you know, was kind of the end of that too, which is like, if you, you know, if you're with someone that, you, first of all, Bob, um, Bob never left anything on the table. I always say this. He always said, I love you. I care about you. You know, one of the memorials was like, look at your last text from Bob. It was all lovey dovey or, or dick pic or something, but not, <laughs> but he would talk. I will say he would want me to let everyone know yeah. he never, ever, ever sent a dick pic. No, to you, but I got plenty. <laughs> None. But um, you, 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 so that's one thing. He never left anything. To the second is that um, when were you with someone that you love, slow down a little bit. There's nothing that important, you know? And like, like you said, when we were at this great dinner, our last dinner at Nobu, and I'm trying to remember what we're talking about, um, you want to, what do we eat and stuff? And, and you know, you say, did, did, did you stay a little longer? You know, for coffee and dessert, I hope so. If you get a chance to sit a spell with someone that you love, don't get up too quickly. Stay a while, linger, indulge, savor, order the cake. You know, how do you get over grief? We're doing it now. I mean, this yeah. is, for me, this is a um, very therapeutic, right? Yeah. Just, I mean, for me, just being with you, and that's why, you know, I, like we Yeah, but I still can't talk be with everyone lot. in the world right, that, right. that, needs, True. that is losing something. We still, I know that I could call you at any time and you would yes. always be there for me. And when I do get to see you, it's just such a feeling of, you know, closeness and, you know, therapy in a sense, because it does, you know, obviously I love you for you, but I love you because of what you meant to Bob too. And, and to all of us. So, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll take Bob's advice and not leave anything on the table. And because we never know how long we have, I will tell yeah. you again, John, I love you very, very much. I love you so much too. And um, I, I'm already loving this show. I, 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 I say this and I, I've said this a few times, but this is what I, this is what helps me sometimes when I lay down I say, I try to ima imagine him still out on the road doing what he, he loves standing on stage, killing another two hours set in front of a couple hundred of the luckiest people on the planet. They're laughing so hard that they weep. And just when they catch their breath, he grabs his guitar and slays with one of his musical closers. There's an encore and another and another. Everyone wants an encore with Bob. On his drive back from the hotel after the gig, Bob calls Kelly and tells her about the show. He says he feels like he's 26 again, alive. Then he asks her to fix up a picture that uh, he wants to post. And she says, it doesn't need fixing, honey. He tells him how handsome he is. He says he loves her with every bit of his heart. And when he gets to the hotel, he puts his head on the pillow. He misses his daughters, his family, and his friends. God, he loves us so much. Bob goes to sleep, dreaming of when he'll see us all again. And he's smiling. I know in my heart he's smiling, still hearing laughter from just a few hours earlier. That makes me uh, somewhat. <laughs> yeah, well, so, that, um, yeah. that makes, it's, it paints the picture of how I want to, I mean, yeah. I, I know that that is all accurate. It is what happened because... Yeah. He did call me and he did say, you know, the last words right. where I love you. And right. it was all wonderful. 
But then obviously we don't know exactly what his last moments were, but that's what I like to picture. Yeah, I think they were that. Yeah. I do. Thank you for painting that picture because. Yeah. You know. Well, he, he, he always did sort of end his act with a song. This is the uh, uh, world premiere world of world premiere. This song called what's it called again? It's called "I'm Not in Love with My Wife's <laughs> Father," and he wrote the song about my dad. <laughs> and this was at his show in Denver. He was playing it on his last tour, but it never made it to the special because he never had a chance to record the special. So the video's not too great because it's me recording it in the back of the club in Denver, uh-huh. and I got yelled at. Somebody came up to me and they tried to tell me to put my phone away and, and said, i was like no i'm off. bob's wife I literally i was like i'm bob's wife and they're like singing no you're not and then i'd have security it was a whole thing anyway he's singing about my he's singing about my dad i i, I need this right. song but this video thank god i actually was able to catch capture it from beginning to end yeah i've been dying to, to have you play this for the public because it's so brilliant and it's also if you listen i mean it's 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 a spark of genius by bob and the lyrics are so you know um subversive you know they're so smart but his voice was great. And me and John Mayer talk about it all the time. Like he was hitting these notes and he, he wrote this song and he would go to places that I would never think of going vocally. And he did and he pulls it off. And um, so here it is, the world premiere of I'm Not, of, in, love. Uh, I'm not in Love with My Wife's Father. Lonely life Never made a real commitment Until I met my wife She was different than the others lie of where she'd been and she had her mother's sparkle and her dad's strong and noble chin wait a minute am I attracted to her dad he's older than me and then there's the fact I love his daughter and her mom is hot too what would I do if this upset my wife what if she was in the audience Tonight. Maybe she'd understand Cause her dad's the kindest man I've ever known And he's got great hair and beautiful soft hands So what if he's the man who's the father of my wife About to be with her for life Here's the chorus, it's very powerful I'm not in love I'm not in love So damn cut, it's got a little tight butt, and I would be a nut to let her go. But I'm not, not in love. I'm not in love. I'm not in love with my wife's father. It's so hot, she looks just like him. Bravo, Bob. Bravo. Oh, bravo. And that is his closer. Yeah. And that's and his encore the, for this the episode. Best, the best thing ever is that my dad actually got to see that. Both my parents went to see him in Milwaukee. Uh-huh. They drove up from Chicago to Milwaukee and they saw that show. Right. And so my dad heard it in person, which made me so damn happy. Anyone <laughs> listening out there, if you've lost someone, God bless you. We, we're with you. Um, I hope you gained a little something from this. I don't know. Yeah. It's just there are a lot of lessons in your book, and if you would have told me by John Stamos, uh, it I mean it was really powerful and really helpful because you have gone through so you've gone through death, divorce, addiction, loss, all of it. You've gone through all of it. Some people maybe just had one of the things, but you've gone through all of it, and you're still here to talk about it and to help people. And I'm just so grateful that you were here today, and I love you Thank very you. much. Uh, I take on every heartbreak. I'm here for every heartbreak because I'm here for every joy. Yeah. And it's been a joy spending the afternoon with you. I love you. I love you, John. Thank you. Let's talk chicken pot pie, one of the most comforting meals of all time. It might look intimidating to make, but really the biggest weapon in your arsenal is a great flaky pie crust recipe. So find your favorite one of those. And remember, you'll probably need to double up the recipe so you have the crust on top and the bottom. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is cook your chicken. I like to simmer mine with some salt and aromatics just to make sure we're getting the most flavor possible. Throw in some bouillon into your water, maybe some herbs, maybe some spices, whatever floats your boat. Simmer until it's barely cooked through and then pull the chicken out and put it on a plate. 
While that's cooling down a bit, put some butter in a pan and saute some onions and celery or whatever veggies you like in your pot pie. You can even toss some frozen peas in there, whatever you like. You'll want to add some flour, salt, pepper, garlic powder, some more bouillon, and celery seed. Once those are nicely cooked, we'll add some water and milk and bring that to a simmer until it's nice and thick. Then you want to shred your chicken and toss it in that mixture as well. Then you're going to prepare your pie crust and pour that thick chickeny goodness into the crust, covering it with more crust over top. Toss that into the oven at 425 degrees for 30 to 40 minutes or until the crust is nice and golden brown. Bon appetito and thanks for listening. Comfort Food is produced by Wheelhouse DNA for Acast. Our executive producers are Fanny Baudry, Cassie Berman, Leah Sutherland, and yours truly, Kelly Rizzo. Our audio producer is Chiara Noni. Special thanks to Camila Goldenberg and Riley Oval Rank for production assistance. Our audio engineer is Matthew Blocka. Our editor is Nick Karismi. This podcast is hosted by me, Kelly Rizzo. Thanks for tuning in.